How do animated shows portray the dad characters? And what does that really say about real life fathers? Like me. Huh? Son, look out! Animated shows can be a reflection of real life and culture, which changes as generations pass. And this in turn can reveal a lot about parents. I've been a dad for five years now, and I wanted to explore how cartoon dads have changed over the years and the real life dads they're based on. Obviously, real life fathers and father figures are complex and not something you can just neatly sum up with sweeping stereotypes and generalizations, but their animated and often parodied counterparts may reveal some relatable qualities that a generation of dads can share, even if it's not the full picture. Dads from the silent generation tend to be portrayed as the stoic, pipe-smoking, upstanding citizen who is always there with the moral lessons and an unhealthy amount of unchecked, suppressed emotions. We only typically see these types of dads in parodies. Daddy, do you want to meet my imaginary friend? Imaginary friends are freeloaders invented by communists to rip off welfare. This may also manifest as the war veteran who tends to be very masculine, overly strict, and to some degree, still at war. The baby boom generation inherits some of the strict order of this is the way it must be done from their predecessors, hence the struggle to adapt to cultural shifts. Oh, math is math. So math crazy. is math. But with a little bit of hippie influence, boomers were more defiant of their parents. And one big example of a boomer subverting the tropes of the 50s father is Homer Simpson. Then we figured out we could park them in front of the TV. Well, that's how I was raised and I turned out TV. The Simpsons has a kind of floating timeline. Homer was a teenager in the 1970s, but somehow also the 90s? But he was at least originally designed to be a boomer. To start, press any key. Where's the any key? Without that veil of father knows best, we learned that they're just as flawed as the rest of us. Hmm, I never thought of fatherhood as something that could affect a kid. It's humanizing and refreshing, but this is where we start to see the shift towards fathers being stereotyped as being useless. Kids, you tried your best and you failed miserably. The lesson is, never try. Homer is capable of demonstrating grand gestures of wholesome fatherhood, especially at the end of an episode. But when the next episode starts, he defaults back to his useless bumbling self again. While it's perfect for comedy, the persistence of the bumbling dad trope, even today, can create a cruel and unfair assessment of fathers. By rebelling against the 50s style of patriarchal households and kids raised through hard discipline, boomers gave their kids the freedom to go out and scrape their knees, staying out until the streetlights turn on, and letting kids just be kids, for better or worse. Oh, hi there. I'm a 1950s dad. You know, when I met my childhood sweetheart at high school, her father said it will never work. So I married an adult woman instead. My darling wife is so good at keeping the house clean, tending to the garden, raising the kids, washing the curtains, making the beds, retiling the roof, putting the carpets on the ceiling, and doing the whole plumbing in the entire house. But then she says to me she wants more help in the kitchen? Mercy me, talk about lazy! So that brings me to this video sponsor, Kami Koto. Kami Koto produces some of the highest quality Japanese steel knives, meticulously handcrafted using traditional Japanese techniques. Each knife is individually inspected to ensure quality and comes with a lifetime guarantee. It also comes in this heavy duty ash wood box for safe storage and is perfect for presents. These Japanese steel knives can cut through meat like butter and cut through butter like, well, meat. And they're even used by Michelin star chefs all over the world. Kamikoto is running an early Black Friday sale, so you can get $50 off any purchase with the discount code EDAKE. So head on over to kamikoto.com slash EDAKE. So thanks to Kamikoto for sponsoring this video. My wife loves them. She's gone around to tell our rather rugged gardener, and our plumber, and our milkman, and our postman, and my brother. No doubt telling him what a great husband I am. Now back to the video. 
Generation X were the MTV generation, accused of being slackers, You're a slacker. but were generally very self-sufficient. Nicknamed the latchkey generation due to them having their own door keys, thanks to a rise of divorce rates and both parents needing to go to work. This aimless independence mixed with shifting cultures led to Gen X being perceived as bleak, cynical and disillusioned. We're the MTV generation. We feel neither highs nor lows. Really? What's it like? Eh. The forgotten generation. This pessimism may continue into their parenting, influencing their animated counterparts. They're no less loving characters, but they may come across as long-suffering or sarcastic. All right, listen, you're my children, and I love you, but you're all terrible at what you do, and I feel like I should tell you. I'd fire all of you if I could. Bob. Alternatively, whilst boomers introduced the concept of a more nurturing, unified family, like involving kids in decisions of family matters, Generation X took this further by playing a heavy part in their child's development with the infamous helicopter parenting. Come back to daddy. You come back to daddy. Three steps more. Three steps more. Oh, oh, I got you. I got you. Oh, you were away for so long. So we'd get fathers portrayed as being overly involved in a kid's life, often uninvited and leading to disastrously embarrassing results. Hi, everybody! <laughs> None of these personality traits are exclusive to these generations in real life, obviously, but it's interesting to see how the animated shows simplify and exaggerate the portrayal of these generations, especially in how the parents parent. The children that followed Gen X are often accused of being even more self-centered due to their obsession with technology and the rise of the internet. But this connectivity has resulted in a generation a lot more community and socially conscious. The millennial, which in turn brings us to millennial parents like me. I got a phone. Come on, man. What do millennial cartoon dads look like? It's dad! Bluey is a hugely successful kids show about a family of dogs, but its real secret isn't its bright colours and vivid Australian setting. The secret is, it's not just a kids show, it's a parent show too. And I have found my spirit animal in the father of the family, Bandit. He is the fun dad. This is all my stuff from when I used to be cool. Here's what the experts say millennial parents do and how Bluey tackles it. Creativity. Something millennial parents do is provide their kids with the space to be creative. Bluey celebrates this with its emphasis on the importance of play. Unlike other shows of its kind, when the imagination play happens, they're not taken to some fantasy world. It's almost always kept grounded in reality. So you can see how the parents really play with the kids. Play and make-believe games not only encourages creativity, but it's academically proven to be hugely important to a child's development, such as emotional intelligence and language skills. A far cry from play being discouraged in favor of hard labor. But it could be hard for a parent to pull themselves away from housework and job work just to dedicate time for play. Bandit regularly struggles to work before being roped into a game, but even if he despairs over the choice of game, he still does it. Oh, not a hospital. Uh -uh. No way. I am not playing Tickle Crabs. Oh, oh not, not dance, dance mode. mode. While millennial fathers and mothers are more capable of dividing the workload of job, life and kids more equally, father play tends to be more physical, boisterous and rough and tumble, such as chasing games. And this doesn't mean the mothers don't do this too. Bandit is frequently playing games involving physical play, which research shows helps kids control their aggression. If the game goes too far, children learn how they should respond, but in a safe environment. Lessons which they can carry into their everyday life. When Bandit plays too aggressively with his youngest daughter, Bingo, they learn together what their boundaries are, without diminishing the playtime. Now I know. <laughs> Expression. Millennial parents are also more open-minded than prior generations, giving children the freedom to explore and express themselves without imposing conformity, finally beginning to eradicate the this is the way it must be done mantra that has kept kids in the closet slowly whittled away by the generations. Bluey has been criticized for its lack of diversity, such as its LGBT representation, not by those who dislike the show, but by its fans, those who celebrate the show and only want to see it get even more enriched. If it's going to be a slice of life show set in the modern world, then we should see more of the modern world. Despite being a preschool show, Bluey isn't afraid to tackle complex subjects. 
One example centers around the mum's sister who is alluded to being infertile. In another instance where the kids are putting on a play reenacting their mum's life, they use a balloon to represent pregnancy leading to The gesture, expressions and dead silence implies that Bluey is a rainbow baby, a child born following a miscarriage. Charlie Aspinwall, the co-founder of Ludo Studio, the production company behind Bluey, stated, We will always write something for the adults and then something for the kids, so you can interpret that how you want to. This freedom of expression also lends itself to exploring complex emotions. One episode begins with Bluey imitating her father, a game of repeating back what he says and does. But the game is interrupted when they encounter an injured bird. Bandit does everything he can, but sadly the bird dies. Bluey struggles with how to feel, so she continues the game. She pretends to discover the bird and seeks aid, mimicking her father's care and tenderness, even going so far as to intentionally steer the story to a sad ending. Bluey uses playtime as a form of therapy, to process emotions in a safe space, to make peace with them, and the parents contribute to the performance under their child's directions. Her expressed feelings and emotions are made valid. Very gentle parenting. Independence. What's often cited with millennials is free-range parenting, and it's basically the opposite of helicopter parenting. It says here we should let them make their own decisions. Well, good luck with that. It encourages more independence by giving children more tasks and responsibilities. In Bluey, we see the kids help out with housework, and they're even allowed to play in the front garden almost unsupervised. This means not only do kids learn about trust, but so do the parents. Free-range parenting is also controversial, as kids as young as 9 or 10 journey alone. Critics consider it a form of dangerous neglect. Actually, it's not too dissimilar to the boomer parents letting kids play out till late. By yourself? It was the 80s. So, can be taken to extremes, but responsibilities can be done in other ways. Bluey's parents may help initiate a game, but then they back away and let the kids carry on, which can help develop their problem-solving skills. <laughs> and Bandit loves inventing problems for them to solve. Is it a uh, Pakistan, can you give us a hand with something? Yeah, no worries, Bluey. I didn't know this was the something. In one episode, Bandit teaches the kids to reward the value of hard work by acting like a limp ragdoll. Oh no, not ragdoll! Leaving the kids with a series of problems to figure out how to move their dad around and get a well-earned ice cream. In another, Bluey struggles to ride her bike straight away and they observe the other kids also struggling with their problems. Bluey offers to help, but Bandit tells her to step back and see how they solve the problem by themselves. Their creative solutions give her the encouragement to not give up so fast. And Bandit didn't even have to stand up. Series creator Joe Brum said of this episode, If there's any type of message, it's aimed at the adults rather than the kids. It's a delicate balance of giving children just enough guidance to get started and, with encouragement, let them figure it out on their own. Trust them. I'd like to get down now. This autonomy should also extend to the parents too, such as having a healthy mental space. I need 20 minutes when no one comes near me. What? Ah, oh, yep, okay. And accepting responsibility. Millennial filmmakers have led to a rise of films where parents realise their own wrongdoing and apologise to their children. Perhaps an examination of generational trauma, a dissection of their own upbringing, or a self-reflection after having kids of their own. And if a parent cannot humbly accept when they are at fault, the child will justifiably feel unseen and unheard. Seeing Bandit screw up and apologize for it shows not only is he able to be vulnerable and emotionally open to his children, but mistakes will happen. And that's okay. Whoop! Whoa, that was a close one. No more of that guy. It can be difficult holding yourself up to the standards of idealized fictional characters. I'm not taking advice from a cartoon dog. I love watching Bluey. I've even watched it after my son's gone to bed. It's a great show for real life. But even as a millennial parent, I'm nowhere as good as Bandit. I know I can do more for my son, spend more time with him, play more games. It's hard when you hold yourself to such an impossible standard. Bluey's dad is more fun than you. It makes me want to be better. One day, while we were out for a walk, my son picked up a rock. 
my immediate instinct was to tell him to put it down. It might be dirty, or he might throw it, or it will slow down our walk because he wants to stop and pick up more random objects, but I stopped, and I thought to myself, what would Bandit do? So, instead of telling him to put the rock down, I praised my son for finding such a great rock. Let's go looking for more rocks on the way home. And now we have a collection. We're only just beginning to see how the Zuma generation handled becoming parents, and the future is wide open for Gen Alpha to define themselves. But in real life, dads can't be so neatly pigeonholed. They can be a mix of strict and kind, attached and detached, smart and not so smart. Generations can leapfrog and cross over, even when apart, an upbringing can still find a way to influence someone to behave the same. 26 years buried in the deepest, darkest jungle and I still became my father. Obviously, there's also absent fathers and abusive fathers, and when those things are not being used as the punchline of a joke, it may be helpful to some viewers to witness these behaviours being openly criticised, and to see the kids of those parents find ways to persevere. After all, every dad is different. But despite all the differences the dads have had across the generations, I think there's two things most fathers have in common. One, we're all still learning, figuring things out as we go along, and that's okay. So long as I continue to try my best, maybe I could be just as good as the big blue dog from TV. And two, we all at one point definitely called the teacher, Mom! <laughs> Gotta be done. Special shout out to this bump's patrons, including Ashley Bird McCarthy, Sloan Schoolcraft, Rusty Robot, Vinny Vex, Double X Studios, Drifter Wolf, Setsune Wave, Useless Jack, Caddy, Nathan Chawinati, Michael Elton, Joe Wood, Matthew Smith, Brett Halford, Clam Wamsley, Joel the Gay Noodle Jennings, Alex Weston, and James's Junk. Right. That's right, Rick. <laughs> and if you would like to support me, then please consider doing so on Patreon. I'm to edit. Thank you, Rick. You're welcome. <laughs>